So good afternoon, evening, everybody, wherever you are in the world. We're here for another World War II TV interview. This time, a pretty exciting show that was a new story to me until I read the book very recently. And uh, my guest tonight is Eric Lee, who wrote the fantastic book Night of the Bayonets about an action in the Netherlands. So um, welcome to the show, Eric. Thank you, Paul. Good to be here. And thank well, it's good to have you. And we've got a few people watching, so that's good. And um, your book, um, I'll put an image up just of um, the cover of it, just so people understand what we're looking about. It's it's a story that I, when we did our little Zoom, pre-Zoom check a couple of days ago, I knew I was vaguely aware of the story when I was in the Netherlands sort of 15, 20 years ago, but I didn't know much about it. And and then, you know, got to know you on Twitter and, and the idea came up. But it's an incredible story. And I'm surprised I hadn't heard more about it before, really. But um, so what which part of the Netherlands are we talking about, Eric? We're talking about um, an island, one of the um, Wadden Islands off the coast of the Netherlands. This is the southernmost. It's the one closest to, I guess, you know, the main part of the Netherlands. And it's the largest of the islands. And it's called Tessel. It's spelled Texel with an X but the Dutch say Tessel, as I learned very quickly. And there was this, well, we'll, we'll get to what happened there, but towards, yeah. to, towards the end of the war in Europe, there's this, there's this engagement that is, and what fascinated me about the book is there's kind of three, three groups of participants, not just two. Yeah? There's, there's the locals, and then there's two protagonists in, involved in the fighting there. And we're talking about um, troops that were fighting for the German Wehrmacht, but they were Ostrupans. They were they were from other parts of you. So just briefly, for in case anyone's watching this who doesn't understand, what were Ostentruppen or the or um, Eastern troops? What where and not not just the ones from Georgia, but what were they generally, Eric? Just for our audience. Well, you know, after the um, after the Germans invaded the Soviet Union in in June 1941 and captured staggering numbers of of Red Army soldiers who were under. It must be emphasized under strict orders not to surrender to the Germans on penalty of death. It was considered treason to surrender, but the numbers who surrendered, especially in the first few months of the war, were staggering. And the Germans saw, sometimes saw, sometimes didn't see, an opportunity here to recruit some of them into the German army, into the Wehrmacht, and put them into specific units by nationality. So not in the SS, that was another thing. They were also Waffen SS units, but the German army itself had these Eastern legions of which the Georgians were one. So generally, these were POWs held by the Germans who were given the choice of starve or fight and chose to fight. And, you know, with the, I mean, I'm from Normandy and those who are familiar with the shows, we have Austin, Ostrupen in Normandy and, and they are very much a mixed bag. Some are fairly kind of hopeless troops and others are quite fanatical and they can be f f fanatical for either side shall we say their their motivations their loyalties are, are are hard to pin down you can't just say they're all this or they're all that because by, by region and as the war changes things change there but we're talking about georgians in this in this particular uh, uh, show tonight so explain briefly how a georgian garrison ended up in an island off the ends. I mean, I realize there's a long version of this story and there's a sort of a shorter version. So kind of a medium length one, I think would work. Sure, you know, um, look, there, there, there were Georgians uh, in the Red Army. Georgia was one of the 15 Soviet republics and there were Georgians in very soon as the Red Army and they were captured like everyone else. And the Germans segregated them as prisoners, putting some of them aside. And there were Georgian emigrants in Germany who were telling the, the Nazis, we can recruit them. The Georgians will be particularly hostile to the Russians, so let's recruit them. And they brought quite a few of them into a Georgian legion. And originally, uh, and these are people who, to say they volunteered is a bit of a, of a stretch. They didn't really volunteer. They were, I even have a story in the book where um, a German officer uh, addresses them, lines up all the Georgian prisoners of war and says to them, uh, which, which of you uh, oppose the Reich? step forward. So no one steps forward. They know they'll be shot if they do. And he says, congratulations, you've completed your induction ceremony into the Wehrmacht. Hmm. So they're not really volunteers, right? And they were sent initially to that, their part of the Soviet Union. The, the um, German army was advancing on the Caucasus. They were trying to cross the Caucasus mountains to get to Azerbaijan, to Baku, which is the greatest source of oil in Europe. Yeah. And oil would have won the war for the Germans. So this was decisive. Racing to get there. Georgia is just on the other side. They were there fighting. But as the war was turning, their loyalty to the Germans was less and less clear. 
as, as you mentioned, it was complicated. The relationship. Yeah, yeah, very complicated. And, and the Germans eventually realized we really can't have these Georgians too close to the front lines with the Red Army because too many of them go running back. As you know, they, they, they go, go back into the ranks of the Red Army. And the whole time, the Red Army is trying to recruit them back. There's loudspeaker broadcasts and doing everything they can to convince these Georgians fighting them to come back. And the Germans are doing the same broadcasting to the Georgians on the other side, telling them to come over. It's complicated. The Germans eventually moved them to the West, first to Poland and then to France. And that's how they wind up there. And eventually this, this group, the 822nd Battalion, is taken up into, into the Netherlands and wind up in the final year of the war there. And the reason this part of the Netherlands is so important is it's a it's a rather large part of the Atlantic Wall. I mean, we've got the 3,000 miles Atlantic Wall from Norway all the way down to the border with Spain. But because of its proximity to the east coast of the UK and the potential uh, for a, a, an invasion coming that way and we went to sort of Operation Fortitude and what have you, there's a lot of German defences in the area. It's a remote part of the Netherlands in terms of coming from the landward side, but from the seaward side, there's this potential threat from the UK. So there's a lot of German bunkers there, there's gun batteries, and so there's a, there's a need to have a large ger German garrison there, even though the region itself is kind of remote. Is, am I right on that? Yes, and, and we always have to remember, you, I mean, looking at it now, you say, why would the Germans build an Atlantic wall anywhere other than Normandy. But, but of course, the answer is they had no idea. Yeah. That Normandy was the location. The Allies could easily have landed in, in Netherlands. And in some ways, that would have made more sense. They would have been closer to Germany. Yeah. And landing yeah. in Normandy was quite a, uh, to use a technical military term, it was quite a schlep yeah. to get to, yeah. to, to, to Germany from, from uh, Normandy. Um, so, yes, this was a significant, obviously, after June 1944, it was clear that the island of Tessel and all those places were no longer militarily significant. And as part of what, what we see in the story is that the allies actually never come there. They bypass it. It's a, it's, by this point, it's a backwater, but it could have been an invasion beach. Yeah, it could have been yeah. an Omaha beach right there in Tessel. So, you know, it's, it's, it's importance had been higher and now it's lesser so, but there's still this port when we get to, you know, to the, the, the spring part of 1945, there are, there are all sorts of parts of Europe that are end up being cut off because the army is, is, in, is pushing on Berlin, but there are these little pockets. I mean, we have them in Normandy, the Channel Lines, and there's parts of Brittany that were still holding out, holding out to a lot later, and Calais as well. So there's these little isolated pockets and that's how this situation ends up there. But, um, the, the 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 interesting thing about your book I found is that in, in that your and we'll touch on it later on there was a lot of mythologizing about this event after war by the the Russians sort of claiming the story as something it wasn't quite for their own purposes and um, but you sort of took it back to ba to basics um, and and actually built it all up again from from the beginning I like that approach and uh, and um, there there's been an idea way before the spring of 44, uh, 45, that there could have been some kind of mutiny uprising there. So, so how did the seeds for this, where do you think the seeds came from? Were they from within the Georgians or was it within the local uh, communist resistance? And we'll bring in them into the story in a minute as well as, you know, where, where does this seed come from, do yes. you think? Well, I think the, uh, the Georgians, we have to emphasize, were never loyal to, to, to the Germans. Not at any moment, right? From the very beginning, they were defecting and running away and being disloyal. There were stories they helped the partisans everywhere. They were not loyal German soldiers. And they were always discussing among themselves quietly, um, could they rebel, could they flee, and, and so on. And by 1944, certainly after June 1944, it was clear the Germans were going to lose this war. Yeah. And, and that was one thing. So the second thing that was clear, and this is unique to them, I mean, that's, that was clear to everyone, right? To every allied soldier knew they were going to win the war at some point after that, once the Normandy landings were successful. To the Georgians, another thing was clear, because the Germans told them this, which is, if the war ends and you are found wearing German uniforms, you know, and if, if we've lost the war, Stalin will kill all of you. Yeah, yeah, You'll yeah. You'll be punished for this. And this is a significant point, because these Georgians realized, you know, oh boy, we had better at some point, you know, basically ditch the uniforms and, and prove our loyalty to Stalin. Very, it's very personal, by the way. Stalin is very much on their thoughts, not just our loyalty to our country, but our loyalty to our leader. And this is in the back of their minds all the time. If Russia is to, if the Soviet Union wins the war, we want to be on the side of the winners, because otherwise we're dead and our families will be, will be punished. That was that was. But is it is it really they want to be on the side of Stalin, or they just want to be on the the winning side to make sure they, they, they survive the war? Yeah, no, they want to survive. They yeah. want to survive. 
they have no, I mean, the loyalty to Stalin stuff, which was very prominent in 1945, was nonsense, right? How yeah. could they possibly felt? But they were, um, they, they needed to survive. They were young men. Yeah. They were, and they were desperate to get home. They were sick of this war and they were gaining nothing from it. And they won the losing side. They had no future. And if the war, you know, they, it's been argued, why don't they just sit there and wait for the war to end? They could have done that. But the fate of many Russian soldiers who did that was they went back to the Soviet Union yeah. and were killed yeah. or were put in the gulag. They knew that because the Germans told them this is what's going to happen. Yeah. So they, they, that was in their minds. The role of the, of the uh, Dutch communists is a, is a more complicated one. If you want to get to that, we can. Yeah, well, we'll bring on the, We'll touch on the Dutch communists as well. I mean, I just before you know, reminding me is also if there are units that are serving with the allies who have having these dilemma dilemmas by this point in the war, the Czech pilots who've been fighting since, with us since 1940 are now not certain what's going to happen if the, the mm -hmm. Soviet Union take over. And you know, many were in prison for 15, 20 years after the war. So there are lots of people who's who from that eastern part of Europe, whose whose future is very very much in the balance, and yes. and they're thinking about their own survival, which is nothing wrong with that. I would be thinking about my survival as well. But yeah, let's let's bring in the complicated aspect of what's going on within within the Netherlands in terms of their politics and resistance movements and their loyalties, because that gets quite complicated again, doesn't it? It does. And, and you know, when I was first first started working on the book, and I was actually interviewed by a Dutch journalist, and he asked me what's What's, what are you trying to do here? I said, I'm trying to figure out who are the good guys and who are the bad guys in this story. And it, in the end, it was kind of hard to find any good guys. And there were lots of bad guys, but probably the worst was the Dutch Communist Party. Right. They had a, they had a skeleton in the closet that every Communist Party in Europe and around the world had. And the skeleton in the closet was for two years during the period of the Hitler-Stalin Pact, they effectively were collaborators with the German Nazi regime in, in their countries. The Dutch Communist Party for two years did not engage in anti-Nazi activity. It saw British Empire as the, their main enemy. They did what the, the Moscow told them to do. They did agitated against the war, did not join the resistance or anything. That period was an embarrassment by 1945, that they went through a period like that of, of at best neutrality toward the Germans. You could argue even collaboration with the Germans. And every, mm. every Communist Party in Europe, I, I did research on the Norwegian Communist Party, the exact same experience. In fact, after the war, the Norwegians burned all the copies, destroyed all the copies of their newspaper from that period, the Norwegian communists. So no one would ever know. But of course, there were witnesses, people knew. So the Dutch communists had this secret. The other thing was they did very little resistance. I mean, the Dutch resistance on the whole is not all that impressive compared to, let's say, the Polish resistance or even the French. Yeah, yeah, yeah. different levels. Not, not that impressive. And the resistance to the communists more complicated because it was so delayed that to wait until... Hitler invaded the Soviet Union before they could actually become the resistance. So they these, they, they these two problems. And the Georgians offered them a solution because the Dutch communists encouraged the Georgians to rebel, help them organize their rebellion. And after the war played the most important role of all, which is they defended, they argued the case of the Georgians to the Soviet communists, convinced mm. them that these Georgians were great. They were anti-fascists anti and so on. So the, the, but the Dutch communists, it's a despicable role because they were telling the Georgians, basically, you guys go out there, fight the Nazis, you know, you, you'll all survive and win, it'll be great, you know, you'll all be heroes. When in fact, it was a hopeless battle from the beginning and they were just sacrificing their lives in their hundreds for nothing. And yeah. they, were, they were lied to by the Dutch communists. And, and yeah, encouraged, it's interesting, encouraged interesting that aspect that I, you know, and, and so, so. To confirm that the the ideas for an insurrection, a mutiny, an uprising had had at least started in 1944, if not chats among them before then. Um, yeah. And I like the aspect as well of the fact that the Georgians were kind of trying to give the, an impression of being a bit kind of not very good at their job, was a bit comical and more interested in swimming and girls. That that really struck. Do you think that was deliberate? That was sort of to try and play up, play down their their efficiency. Yeah, you're afraid that there's, there's one eyewitness account that they're yeah. having in the book where somebody does say these Georgians pretended that they couldn't shoot when in fact they were all sharpshooters, it yeah. turns out. Um, as I say, it's, it's one anecdotal account that may or may not be true, but certainly right, okay. the Germans were not expecting the ferocity of, of the Georgian attack when it came. It was a bolt from the blue. They had no clue that this could happen. And the Georgians would fight the way they did. And, and in fact, you know, I, I was just re was reviewing my, my uh, summaries of the numbers of those who died that basically for every Georgian who died, something like four or five Germans died. I mean, they, were, they fought fanatically and fought well against yeah. the Germans. That was totally unexpected. So let's talk about the, the what was happening 
on test cell as it gets to spring 1945. So there's a sort of series of little trigger moments that happen. Um, one with the fact that the Omega takes some of the Georgians off somewhere else. There's other things happening. Talk about a, an uprising in um, uh, um, Hook of Holland. So tell us about these little sequence of events in the spring of 45 that kind of, if you like, ignited the, uh, the final, the final um, rebellion. Right. Well, by this time, obviously, by, the, by 1945, early 1945, it, it was obvious that um, the Nazis had lost the war. And the yeah. Georgians, by this time, were already on Tessa. They'd been in another part of the Netherlands previously. And they were mulling the idea of a rebellion across the Netherlands. They could mobilize these Ostrupen all over the place, which, of course, was a fantasy. All the only people they had access to were their own. Um, they, the trigger, the main thing that happened was they, well, their role there was to defend this Atlantic wall and to, and to police the local Dutch. It, it was a great posting. It, yeah. it wasn't as good as the, those who were in the Channel Islands who, were, were, you know, who had the best war of anybody, but it was pretty good. Nothing yeah. bad was happening to them. Everything was fine. They were enjoying themselves. They had food. It was great. And then um, in the beginning of April, 1945, the Germans made a critically stupid decision, one of many, to tell, tell the Georgians that tomorrow morning, 50% of the Georgian battalion is going to be taken to the mainland and taken to, uh, to fight the British and Canadian forces uh, and, and, you know, and, and basically lose their lives against the Allies in a pointless last ditch battle that yeah, was doomed yeah. to failure. And that night, the Georgians like, heard these orders and that night they convened and, and decided this is it. Now, now we have no choice but to fight. Part of their, their thinking, part of the reasoning was um, these men, when they go to the mainland and to fight, they will immediately desert to the Allies. They will not be loyal German soldiers. And the Germans will punish the ones who stayed behind on Tessel for the treason mm. of, their, of their colleagues. That was part of their thinking. But this was absolutely the moment. The, the Germans uh, were never expecting. One of the striking things about the story is that the German, the, the German commander of this Georgian battalion, Major Klaus Breitner, who had spent years with these men, he had trained them. He knew them very well, that he was convinced that they adored him, worshipped him. Yeah, that's a picture of him. Um, he was shocked that, that, his, that these men who he considered his friends, his colleagues, would turn on him. But he's the one who passed on the order to them that they had to go to the mainland and, and to fight there. And that's interesting you said that because this this he felt he had this loyalty. Do you think he was just deluded or do you think they actually, the Jordans actually were convinced Clever enough to convince him they did actually care. What was it? A bit of both. I mean, well, he, he wouldn't have known all the Georgians. Remember, he had, um, no. I guess, an adjutant who was with him all the time who actually remained loyal. He was like the one Georgian who didn't support the rebellion. And I think he was shot by the Georgians themselves. So he, it's not like he knew all the Georgian soldiers, he knew their leaders. And they, they're the main leader, uh, the officer, Shalva Oladze, who was a, had been a pilot in the, in the Red Air Force. Uh, he was leader of the rebellion. He played the role of, of a loyal uh, German soldier. He's quite dashing. I think he looks a bit like Errol Flynn in this picture. Yeah, a little bit. Yeah, yeah. A little bit. He's a dashing fellow. Um, he would have, uh, Brighton would have known him and worked with him closely. And remember, they worked together from 1942 until 1945. That's quite a long time in war to be working side by side. Breitner completely trusted Loladze to be by his side. And both at the time of the rebellion itself and for years later, because Breitner survived, mm. it, he made clear how, how shocked he was by what had happened. Wow. And, you know, when I was researching for this, I mean, I had your book that you sent me kindly. Thank you very much. But I also, to get some questions, I looked at what else was on the internet about it and what have you, looked at some stuff, other, just, you know, to, to pad out my knowledge. And, and we'll touch on the kind of the, the Russian mythologizing a bit later on. But th there's this clear idea I found on the internet that this insurrection rebellion was, was very um, disorganized, kind of POWs without any weapons, sort of just kind of, you know, getting angry one day and running. It was actually a pretty well organized military coup, wasn't it? It was, it was, it really was, you know, it was, it reminded me in reading it a little bit of the Warsaw uprising and reminded me a little bit of the, of the 1916 Easter rebellion in Dublin, that sort of let's, let's go out with a military force and take over key points. So if you can run through kind of what their actual plan was, it certainly doesn't sound to me when I'm reading your book, like some sort of, you know, cigarette packet written down five minute plan. This was, this had been thought out and they obviously they knew the land. They knew that, that island, like the backs of their hands they have been there for some time. So, so run through what their plan was 
Okay, so, and, so first of all, they, they gave their plan a name, right? They called it Operation Day of Birth, which is how, how yeah, the Dutch call yeah. it. The Georgians have told me it's just Operation Birthday, but it sounded more exotic to call it Operation Day of Birth. The, the, when they met in that little wooded area, there are small wooded areas on the island. They met in one of them, discussed what they were going to do. They, um, each kind of sub-commander was given a point on the island to seize. So there was by the harbor, there was the airfield, there was the main town, it's a, it's a village, Den Borg, et cetera. They each had a place to go to. Some of them were quite successful, like seizing the airport, it's an airfield, mm. was incredibly important because they expected that the British would come help them. So the British had to be able to land planes there. So they had to seize, and they seized that quickly. And, and there's a harbor on the East Coast, which they seized immediately very well. They were gonna hold that. And they seized the main village. And they captured the Germans who were there and killed them. They seized all the German fortifications and bunkers in the center of the island. But there were two points where they sent troops to, to um, seize where they failed. And these, this was decisive for their defeat. One was the, the northern battery of, of naval guns on the northern part of the island. And the other was the southern battery of naval guns. These, were the, these are the famous fortifications. This is the reason yeah. why Tesla was strategically important. These are these massive, powerful guns, which uh, they knew if we don't capture these guns, Theoretically, the Germans could turn them inland. They could face, instead of facing the sea and pummel allied ships, they could be turned on the island itself. The reason why they couldn't get to the guns was these men were Wehrmacht soldiers. They were not in the Navy. The German Navy controlled the batteries. Mm. So the guards who were there would not let them in. They couldn't just say a password and pop in and say, hey, Fritz, how's it going? They were banned from entering these places and they couldn't get in. In either case, they, they were held off. So they didn't seize those things. So they basically took most of the island in a well-organized military campaign um, had the element of surprise, killed an estimated um, 400 German soldiers the first night, which is, I think, more German soldiers than were ever killed by the Dutch resistance in the entire war. Wow. They killed in a single night. It's, a, it's an extraordinary event. I caught the Germans completely by surprise. So yes, it was absolutely a precision military operation, well thought out. They'd obviously been dreaming of this for a long time. They did know the island extremely well, which is very important later, in the later part of the uh, war of attrition they fought, they really did need to know every corner of that island. Um, but they didn't com uh, accomplish all their goals that first night. But I think we need to just elaborate a little bit on that, what that night brought, because it did after all give the name of your book. It's, it, mm -hmm. it, it, there, there was some real sort of drama to it, you know, in, in that their, their intention was for this to be um, silent and 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 deadly and 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 so the idea of of using bayonets and 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 indeed it's cutthroat razors and razor blades. I mean, not that we want to dwell on the violence as such, but it is the name of your book. So let, yeah. for those who aren't aware, who are watching this, this this was pretty brutal stuff that happened that night, wasn't it? So kind of explain in kind of you know not <laughs> playing on the drop, you know how this was organized and what happened. I mean, it, it, it it's in crazy stuff, isn't it? Yeah, well, the first they realized they needed the element of surprise, right? So they needed silence. Yeah. They couldn't make a lot of noise doing this. They actually shared barracks with German soldiers, right? They were part of the same army. So these German soldiers were, all, were sleeping, hundreds of them, in their various bunkers and barracks to which the Georgians had full access. So the Georgian plan was with our bayonets and what they called shaving knives. And I actually saw a, a you know, Red Army shaving knife recently in a museum in Moscow and realized these are deadly things. It's not like a Gillette Mach 3. These are yeah, shaving yeah. knives that will kill you. Um, and, 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 they're, and they're personal knives. They went in and slashed the throats of sleeping German soldiers in large numbers. And each, each one knew who they had to kill. They would tell, you know, you're going to go into that bunker. There are going to be five Germans there. They're going to be sleeping. You kill those five. Every man knew who he had to kill. Men boasted later, I killed 20 that first night and so on. They knew. They also had to use their weapons. So at a certain point, they, they, they were shooting and there were hand grenades thrown and the, the, uh, the alert was raised, but they had already killed so many Germans. I mean, literally 400 Germans, it's extraordinary. There were only 800 Georgians. So they were really just, each Georgian had blood in his hands by, by, the, by the morning. And they had, by, by morning, when morning broke, they had the island and they announced that we, we've won, we've liberated the island. Wow. I mean, I mean, that's and the fact is they're killing people that they had been living and working with. I mean, they they would have been at least on kind of nodding terms. I mean, for the point of uh, what people watching, the Georgian language is not Russian. Is it? Right. So there was a big communication issue there that sometimes they would speak German with the with the Dutch and the and, and the German. But there it's it's a completely separate language, isn't it? So so communication yes. was was very difficult 
generally, generally. And, and Major Breitner, again, after the war and rationalizing and defending, he would talk about how we really did share everything with them. They had the same rations we had. We would take them on our, when he would go back to Germany to see his family on, on his break, his leave, he would take his Georgian adjutant with him. And so he wow. said, yeah, we treated them like family. And you see, there are a couple of photos in the book. I don't think I sent you these photos. There's photos in the book of these German soldiers like sleeping on the, on the beaches and drinking and partying and with their girlfriends. The Germans also were completely relaxed. They didn't see the Georgians as a security threat. Looking back now, we'd say, what are you, crazy? These are former Red Army soldiers who didn't volunteer to be there. Of course, they're a security threat. They didn't see it that way. Well, that's, not- that's that general issue of the Germans being complacent and not seeing the wood for the trees through the latter part of the war generally, isn't it? I mean, and you yeah. said earlier about it here being a good posting for the Georgians. It would have been a good posting for the Germans as well by this point. Maybe not so good early 44 when the invasion might have come there. But by this point, anything coming your way from inland, you're going to get a bit of notice about it. It's not going to happen immediately, is it? You're, you're, you're in a kind of a, an outpost. So I guess everybody been having a pretty, pretty nice time. And then suddenly your bunk mate, as it were, you yes. know, pulls out a razor blade and slashes your throat. I mean, it's it's... It's yeah, I mean, and also I'm saying by this point in the war, by April 1945, it would have been clear to the German soldiers there that they were actually in no danger from the Allies. The Allies were no longer bombing yeah. that part of the uh, yeah. Netherlands, and the Allied armies were far to the east. They were racing toward the German border. They weren't interested. Yeah. There's nothing up there the Allies need you at all. And we'll come on that later on, because I, I, I was going to pick up on the fact that when you talked about this this plan, the the about seizing the airport, the airfield that they they thought the British would would come. So just to elaborate on that point there, that when the when these Georgians plan that, your belief is that they thought they were going to be relieved by someone coming from somewhere to help them. Where, where did they get that idea from? Where why would they have thought that? They saw themselves at this point that they were part of the Allies, right? We have now right. joined the ranks of the Allied armies. We are going to liberate Tessa. This is how they pitched it to the Dutch people. It's like yeah. Yeah. the Allied armies are now here. They've liberated whatever Amsterdam, and now we've liberated Tessa. You can take out the flags. The war is over. That was really how they pitched it. And they thought we'd get hold of a radio, and we'd radio England and tell them, we've liberated Tessa. Can you send over some troops to accept the surrender of the remaining Germans? That's how they, they saw it. That was their interpretation. Um, they also had a plan B. When that didn't work, this the, they couldn't get the radio to work or the issues they knew they couldn't raise them. And they were unaware that the British knew everything that was happening on Tessel in detail in a real time because of uh, Enigma. The British yeah. were decoding and yeah. decrypting the, the German transmissions. They were well aware there had been a mutiny on Tessel. Um, they didn't, the, the Dutch, uh, Georgians didn't know that. So their plan B was they sent a what's called a lifeboat a small motorized craft with a bunch of Georgians over to England. It took them 24 hours to get there across the channel. And they were sent there to tell the British, get the RAF over there and help us. We're holding the airfield. We're waiting for you to come. That was their assumption. Which, which is how your book starts. And that was, that was the, the yeah. And it was Norfolk when I'm from Essex, a couple of counties down. Yeah. So the fact that they, their little boat arrived in April in Norfolk, it was, oh, hang on, there's Norfolk coming into this story. I wasn't expecting Norfolk to come into the story, frankly. <laughs> and, and, and with hindsight, we now know that the idea of the Allies coming to the rescue of a few Georgians and people in the north of the Netherlands was unlikely because we weren't even bothered about our own kinfolk in the Channel Lines at this point, sure. were we? I mean, we'd... we'd we that's you know when we we all we all say the great britain was never occupied and people always put in brackets except for the channel lines because we kind of tend to forget that and right. we didn't really particularly give a, a two thoughts about them you know because there's there's we've got limited resources at this point and we want to right. use what resources we have against key military locations which is going to berlin and killing hitler it's not it's not going to tesla it's not going to the channel line so that yeah with not with, with hindsight a bit of naivety there but so the operation begins 400 Germans killed in a pretty graphic manner um, and and they've seized some but not all of the key points the two the two batteries at either end are not in in hands which again is similar into Warsaw and Dublin that it nearly goes to plan but they yeah. they miss out on a couple of key things that means it's all going to start unraveling and and we I don't think we established really how many Germans were on the island we, we you know there's a battalion of, of 800 plus Georgians so how many Kriegsmarine and Wehrmacht were there on the island as well as them? We don't know exactly. We, we know we the know. estimates were the number of Germans who were killed was over 2,000. But there were Germans right. brought to the island you know, a little bit later in the story. Yeah, so we, yeah, yeah. we don't know we'll how many there at the beginning, soon, yeah. probably a few hundred were there at the beginning. 
so so you know in that sense the Georgians have the advantage at the beginning they have complete surprise they 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 know where the Germans are exactly they know the locations and it starts going really quite well and then um of course it doesn't quite achieve everything so how does it go from a dramatic um you know quick sudden coup to as it becomes it's quite drawn out you know almost two month long campaign and it was and that's when the dutch civilians get involved as well so so again we you know we we can't do the entire story but kind of run through the key points of what happened next well, well you, you mentioned that the, more the, the germans they, came isn't it that's the, in a nutshell lots more germans came and it got a bit shitty really yeah right? but there's, a, there's one thing we're missing which when, when i say they, they knew where the germans were and they were able to slash their throats and kill them and had surprise there was one german where they didn't know where he was right and this, yeah, is, of course. this is major brightener right, major brightener yeah. should have been in his barracks he's, he's an officer but he had a place to sleep the army gave him he wasn't there now, he tells a story, Breitner, after the war, that he was suffering from some kind of medical issue and had to be somewhere else. But everyone on the island today in Tessa will tell you, Breitner, and, the, and I was actually shown the house. Breitner was in this house that night because this is where his girlfriend lived. He had a mistress, a Dutch mistress. He was hanging out with her that night. That's why the Georgians didn't find him. When he hears the first shooting and realizes something, is, is commotion going on, he goes to see what's going on. He finds another German officer. And they go toward where the Georgians are. He doesn't know what's happening. He tells the German officer, the other German officer, you go first. Let's see what's happening. Very, very brave. And the other, mm. as the Georgians immediately kill that guy, he realizes, oh, shit, and goes um, racing toward one of the, the batteries, to, uh, hoping that it hasn't been taken by the Georgians. And manages after hours to get there. And he gets off the special radio message to yeah. Berlin that reaches Berlin eventually, fairly quickly which Hitler sees. Now, this is an extraordinary moment. Try, uh, if you've seen the film Downfall, you can picture what yeah, it was like yeah. in Hitler's bunker. Here's Hitler trying to manage a war that's rapidly ending. The German Empire is being shrunk daily in size. And on the, in the middle of nowhere, a completely irrelevant island, strategically irrelevant, a bunch of Georgians have killed some Germans. He could have ignored it. You know, whatever. It's a footnote to the history of the war. Instead, Hitler becomes enraged. These men were wearing Wehrmacht uniforms. And they pledged an oath of loyalty to me personally, like all Wehrmacht soldiers do. And it was a personal betrayal these Georgians had done. And he issues the order to, with whatever it takes, land troops on the island and kill all the Georgians. Take no prisoners. They don't get to be prisoners twice. They all get killed. That was, the, that was Hitler's reaction to it. And ordered, as the German empire is fighting for survival, the deployment of very large numbers of Germans, including possibly tanks, onto this remote and unimportant Dutch island to take vengeance on these Georgians who he feels betrayed by. I mean, when I read that bit, that, that bit, it almost symbolizes how nutty Hitler can be in, in, in that there's a bigger picture and there's a sideshow that is where he gets his angry with. And uh, yeah, as you say, you know, that is right in the middle of that downfall period where all the memes come from him getting angry at his desk. And yeah. he's getting really angry about something that, as you just say to yourself, despite the fact you wrote a book about it, is actually in the in in the scheme of what's going on in the spring of 44, it's a speck of it's just it's irrelevant. And yet he sends, you know, immediately kill all those Georgians, kill all those rebels. I mean that's that's dramatic. I I, I also want to touch on the this this Brightner fellow because I, I got this sense reading your book that you were really glad to have got his post-war accounts. Obviously he told various people, various things over here, but you didn't quite, you didn't quite ditch, ditch, ditch his account, but also you, you understood that there were elements of it that he had kind of not lied, but the story was his to write it as he wanted. You were very diplomatic how you refer to his, you know, that like the fact, did he have, was he there or did he have a, a mistress? You, you, I, I like the way you skirted around whether you exactly believed him or not. It was interesting. Well, there's a lot of things. Uh, I mean, in, as you know, with the Second World War, there's a lot of stories where we don't actually know what happened, right? Yeah. So there are conflicting eyewitness accounts. So in my book, um, and my Georgian friends told me that's what they actually liked about the book, because I don't actually make judgments. Yeah. Right? Especially where I don't know. I'm trying to figure out the, the facts. Was Brighton with his mistress or did he have a medical problem? I don't know. But it's important to tell both sides of the story. The important thing was Brightner survived that first yeah. night and that was yeah. decisive for mobilizing the germans to hit back at, yeah. at the georgians yeah. i should emphasize even before that happened even before hitler issued his order the the brutality of the first day of fighting 
the take no prisoners stuff was already quite present. There were moments where a bunch of German officers come out of a hotel in the center of the village, the center, with their hands raised and surrender. And George is like, great, you've surrendered, come here. And then they shoot them all, just mm. like that. There, there was real, I mean, and the Germans, of course, were doing the same to the Georgians and to some of the Dutch. There, was, there were no rules of war here. And I've, so people have told me that this is actually not abnormal when there's a mutiny soldiers in uniform mutiny against their officers. It's not unusual to basically have a techno prisoner's attitude. There's no more gentlemanly warfare. There are no rules of war. These men have forfeited their lives by yeah, rebelling. Yeah, yeah. So both sides took the attitude that we're not gonna take any prisoners at all. And they didn't. Well, you see that even in Normandy where I am, you know, when things start off fairly gentlemanly and then one side does something, it starts notching up, the, uh, but it doesn't go backwards. Once it starts going up, it kind of, it keeps on going at that rate. And when you start with people being killed in their beds with bayonets, yeah. it's clearly not going to go back to sort <laughs> of people it sending out fires there. with white flags and things. And, you know, yeah. it, it's going to start maintain that kind of level. And, the, and, you know, you don't overplay the drama in your book. You just state it, as you said there, factually, but there are, you know, and there are war crimes we can touch on as one of my questions yeah. for later on. You know, the, 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 the level of violence and is, is pretty, high through the whole thing isn't it and you know and it, it yeah it, it starts out as it carries on so uh then the the dutch the this let's well as it came up let's address the war crimes because within all of this there's actually not very many actual um war crimes to be listed specifically from it it's uh, there were is it 12 12 dutch or something were killed on the 10, 10 or 12, 10. Was, uh, yeah, on the very first day, the Germans rounded up a number of Dutch men. Um, I think 10 in the end were killed, yeah. put them into, into a lorry and drove them to another part of the island. I was taken there because they built Dutch, had built a memorial to them and, and executed them, just yeah. shot them to death. A couple of them escaped. They jumped off the lorry and escaped, which gives a sense of the chaotic feel yeah. they would have been. This would have been a day or two in, into the rebellion when the Germans had retaken the, the main village. And the Dutch, to go back a day, the Dutch welcomed the Georgian rebellion and really actually believed that the war for them had ended and took out their flags and somehow they found Soviet flags and there were Dutch and Soviet flags flying in the village. And the Germans, um, this, this happened in other parts of Europe. I know that uh, during the Battle of the Ardennes in late 1944, there were cases where the Germans took reprisals against Belgian villages that had welcomed yeah, the Allies. Yeah, yeah. So this was, this was a risk. The Dutch may not have been aware, but they really thought it's April 1945. An Allied army has just liberated our island. We'll take the flags out. What can happen? And then the Germans come back the next day. It's the stuff of nightmares. Yeah. And then at the same time, as it goes on, because the, then it, the surrealness of it is that there's now news coming from Europe of, you know, Hitler's going to be killing himself in a bunker and the, the war is, is coming to an end. And yet here it hasn't, it hasn't, calm down at all i mean that the fact that it carries on beyond the day is is staggering and um and it sort of fizzles out rather than comes to an end it, it, it there's no it, it just sort of slowly kind of winds down but let, let, let's run through some of those key you know because the germans send in a shitload of people to, to quell this don't they and, and they, they march across the island in formation they march across the fields and the, you know, a large large part of the island is as much of the netherlands is filled in sea Right? So yeah. it's very unusual. It's largely flat. There's a network of canals. And the German army walks the length of the island in formation, hunting down the Georgians. And the Georgians are hiding in canals and in farmhouses and in the woods and everywhere. And bit by bit, the Germans are reclaiming the whole island. But it's a brutal day-by-day -day fight. And there are certain key locations the Georgians fight ferociously. And the most famous one was the lighthouse yeah. at the northern yeah, tip yeah. of the island. That was held up by the Georgians. The, it was, I don't know what the strategic significance was, but it was a iconic symbol of the Georgian resistance. There were quite a few of the Georgians there and the Germans sent in a, a unit of the Hermann Goering division, their, their sappers, to, to blow up the lighthouse. And this is a, apparently a staged photograph of some of the Georgian rebels who would not have looked so, you know, I don't know, fit. It, it does look a bit staged, doesn't it? It, it is almost certainly staged, but yeah. this is, these are the actual rebels themselves and these would have been, they would have worn shoddier clothes than this, I think also. Remember, they didn't have a yeah. chance to change or take showers during this rebellion, this mutiny. But and I mean, so the sending was, in, yeah. sorry, sending in the Hermann Goering or elements of the Hermann, I mean, that's that's throwing at this point in the war. Okay, the war's lost anyway, but yeah. this is just throwing away a unit that you yes. could be using way better. 
I mean, yeah, they, 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 you know, the writing's on the wall. They're going to lose the war. But the, you know, the, the German Green Division, they've been, they've been pretty good. They've been, they're, they're a pretty f- f- fearsome unit. Wasting him in this on revenge mission is just, is just it, 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 crazy. It, it, it gets crazier because you think, I mean, obviously it's crazy in April 1945 to be having this fight, right? It's ridiculous yeah. to be doing this. But comes May 5th, and every German soldier in the Netherlands knows it's surrender time. The German army in the Netherlands surrenders three days before VE Day. Yeah, but the yeah, orders yeah. been given. So all the German armies, all the Netherlands surrender. The army in Tessel has no one to surrender to yet. So they're waiting for the Allies to come, and then they'll, they'll surrender. Meanwhile, they still have these Georgians, but this time there's maybe 200 Georgians left alive, a bit over 200. So the Germans are terrified of the Georgians. The Georgians are taking shots at them. It's the, a guerrilla war at this point, a war of attrition. So the Germans have these Georgians taking shots, and they're, they're scared. They're holed up in various parts of the island trying to maintain order. They think that their job is to maintain order here. Um, and this goes on for two weeks. It goes until May 20th, which is extraordinary. At that point, Canadian soldiers land on the island and discover what's been happening there. For them, yeah. yeah. Yeah, and we and you know we just you know we kind of dismissed it in that conversation. But I mean, they'd started with sort of eight hundred ish Georgians, and they've lost two thirds to three quarters during this 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 engagement. And and you know, I'm sure you, if you'd had more accounts, you could have just done account after account after account of these little skirmishes in last ditch buildings and ditches and woods and fields where these Georgians presumably running low of ammunition uh, and everything else are just being hounded by ever increasing large numbers of Germans. I mean, and and so. The brutality of the initial 400 Germans being killed by the Georgians over the next few weeks, they're losing three quarters of their own people uh, in, a, in an increasingly futile and hopeless uh, uh, engagement. So it's um, yeah. well, awful the, the, There are famous things, there are things the Germans did, right? One thing they did was they, when they would capture a, a Georgian, which was rare, Georgians weren't surrendering, but on the rare occasions when a Georgian would put his hands up, the Germans would march them out and tell, tell them, remove your uniform. They would yeah. wear a tattered German uniform, remove it, and then dig your grave, and then they'd shoot and put them in the grave because they weren't allowed to be wearing German uniforms anymore. They disgraced the uniform. So they would do that and, and, and slaughter them. They found that when they would approach a farmhouse, if they thought there might be Georgians inside, these Georgians were sharpshooters. They were snipers. So the Germans would burn, set fire to the farmhouse. And then the Georgians would, would run out, and then they'd shoot them while they were running out. And this was how they... They, they killed the leader of the Georgian rebellion, Shalvaladze, who was yeah. with one or two other men in a farmhouse. The Germans had um, intelligence that Loladze was there. That we believe they had intelligence. The stories about who betrayed him, which, which the Dutch farmer um, said where he was. He was uh, chased out. He fled in, into a ditch with, with, a, with his a colleague. Um, and they stayed there overnight and, were, and was spotted in the morning. And the Germans shot them. And the Germans, this time, didn't know who they were. He wouldn't have looked like he looked in that photo in some pristine uniform. No, 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 a bit ragged and yeah, unshaven. Yeah. And... yeah, so, you know, they didn't know who he was. And we know this because a day or two later, they put up posters in the island, you know, that he was wanted, dead or alive. So the, the brutality of the, of the German um, massacre of these Georgians went on for weeks and weeks and weeks, right up until the, the day the Canadians landed. The Germans so were that's... armed and disciplined till yeah. the very end. So let's bring the Canadians in because as soon as it, 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 it's the second Canadian Corps, isn't it? As soon as that, you know, to me, I've done various shows this summer about the Canadian Second Corps all through Normandy. I mean, these guys by this point are absolutely knackered. I mean, they have been fighting from Normandy in June through some in- ca- campaign for court. They And the Canadian Army, as we know, has not got that luxury of being able to bring in new fresh units to replace the combat units, which the American Army is doing by this point. Hence, some of the problems with the Battle of the Bulge is they've got new units straight in the line and the the veteran units have been given a few days R&R, blah, 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 and the the SS Piper's SS. But these guys, the second Canadian uh, Canadian Corps, have been pretty much slogging it on foot all the way from Normandy. So at this point, the war... They are a knackered and b they all want to get home without being killed. I mean, so I can completely understand where if you're a Canadian commander coming up this way, your sense of urgency is is going to be different to the people on the island who want you to come. But what? But there's there's a fan. I mean, the the John Buchan connection was was amazing. Yes, but, we, but, but even before we get to John Buchan, the the the, um, the Canadian officer who first lands on the island, the commander of that force. It has been in the war since September 1939. He's, he went over yeah. the first Canadian ship. So he's been there for almost six years in yeah. Europe. 
fighting the Germans. And they've just completed victory parades, parties. You know, the war's been over for two weeks for them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And he's, he goes over, to the, like two of them, go over to the island and are told what happens. And he writes in the war diary. And I, I got their war diaries from the, they were a Royal, Royal Canadian Artillery. They have a museum somewhere in, in Manitoba in some small town, had this museum and they have the war diaries. And I read their account of what it was like to arrive in this island, Tessel, and to hear that the war actually hasn't ended there. That they're yeah. armed Georgians and armed Germans and they're shooting at each other. And he describes it in the war diary. It says, we found a kind of musical comedy situation. That's how he saw it. Yeah. But their arrival put an end to it. The Germans, you know, um, agreed to dispense with the uniforms and were taken off in a very orderly fashion on, on ships and, and then marched back to Germany, whatever was done with German prisoners en masse. And, um, you know, Breitner survived. Um, a few hundred Germans did survive. We don't know how many Germans were taken off the island as, as corpses. We know that very right. large numbers yeah. of them were removed from the island. But that's how they left. But the Georgians were all over the island, many of them still in hiding at this point. And there's a tragic story of one of them um, accidentally killing a Dutch person who had been, was helping him. The, the, who, uh, he was showing off his gun and reassuring the Dutch person that he was oh, in no God, danger. Yes, that, that, that was very moving, that story. Yeah, was the, the, he was very young, person. wasn't he? He was like 17 or 18 or something. And he yeah. felt incredibly guilty his whole life. That, oh my God, I've just killed someone who's been helping me and been nice to me. And it was the Dutch family eventually forgave him, but he never forgave himself. That was sort of the last casualty of this terrible, tragic battle was this Dutch uh, person who we, who we killed. There were a total of, of 85 Dutch people died in the fighting, which is a very high number. And some of them were children who had been evacuated to Tessel from the Dutch mainland because yeah. it was considered a safe yeah. place. No, that, that bit was remarkable as well. They've been put there again because it was a safe, right. lots of food, away from everything location. And they didn't, you know, evacuees essentially, aren't they? They're, yes. they're, they're, yes. The British use of the word evacuees. So, so this whole situation ends, you know, two weeks after war. And then um, the Canadians, you know, and you, you just mentioned the war diaries, they kind of dismiss it almost. And then almost immediate, it seems to me, the kind of Russian legend out of this because even on the island there's the the they refer we'll come on to the cemetery later but they refer to the cemetery as the russian cemetery so it all it got this story about being russians and the georgian bit kind of got lost a little bit there right. so very very quickly this sort of ho not hollywood version but kind of a, a legend version of it came about and um and so tell me what the Russians did with this story. As we you know, the Cold War begins and the, all the, the, the rive of Germany and Britain and America. So, so how, how did it become this, this kind of legendary figure to the point where they actually made a feature film about it, isn't it? it? Um, yeah, look, the, the, first of all, the, um, the bit about them being Georgians and not Russians is an issue we come up with against all the time. If you yeah. go to Guernsey, the channel of Guernsey, there's, there's a, a, a museum of the occupation and there's a... a um, some artifacts from Georgians who were based there with the Georgian flag on them. And it says in Latin characters, Georgian, and it's labeled in English, you know, badges and artifacts of Russian soldiers. Yeah, they weren't Russian yeah. soldiers. They were Soviet soldiers. They were Soviet Georgians. Um, the, myth the mythology is really a striking part of the story that the, um, the first, the reality of the Georgians went back and largely were not punished and mo mostly returned to civilian life fairly quickly. There were some examples of arrests and some, it was delayed, but on the whole, they didn't suffer so terribly when they got back to the Soviet Union. And part of what was going on was they were being lobbied for, not only by the Dutch Communist Party, I mentioned earlier, but the Canadians themselves, and later General Eisenhower, writing quite forceful letters to the Soviet leadership saying, these Georgians were part of the Allied forces. They did their bit to defeat the Nazis. They yeah, should be treated yeah. as, as honorable men. Um, and so there was that. And the, the Russians also didn't like the idea that there were Soviet soldiers who fought as as German soldiers, it was a bit embarrassing. So for many reasons, the Soviet leadership decided within a year of this, that these guys were heroes. They had risen up behind enemy lines. They were POWs, they were unarmed. This is one of the myths. They were unarmed yeah, POWs, yeah. The German prisoners. And it's incredible what they did, the heroism. And part of the issue that comes up here is if they were prisoners of war, how were they wandering around this island making contacts with the Communist Party and making plans? Prisoners don't do that. They knew, they met, they met the Dutch resistance because they had free access to every part of the island because they, they were part of the occupying army. And of course they were in uniform. There were photographs of them in uniform. And of yeah. course they were armed and we have photographs of them being armed. So there was a mythology that, of that, which comes out very strongly in the film 20 years, 25 years later, that was made, this very silly film made about them. But they, they began an annual ceremony 
at the uh, this is like this is the poster for the film. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, which is in the title has been translated as I understand it, as Crucified Island. It was a feature yeah. film shot in black and white. Um, it is from beginning to end nonsense and, and untrue. Uh, very heroic pictures of you know heroic dashing young Georgians. Um, some of whom I'm told were later became kind of sex symbols of the Soviet cinema. So yeah, I, I tried to find it to watch it, and I haven't I haven't managed to track it down yet. But I mean, <laughs> consider yourself lucky. I had to watch okay. it. It yeah. wasn't really difficult in the 1950s Soviet Union to kind of suppress truth and get a, a, your own version out. I mean, they're, 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 I've got a series of the films they're making there, their liberation series made where Stalin is portrayed as, the, and Hitler's kind of portrayed as like a shrew like. I mean, they are, they are telling the verse of the war exactly how they want to tell it. Yeah. And no one questions it because it's, it's, it's Uncle Joe and Stalin. So, yeah, managing to conceal it. But it did mean that when you, I mean, we'll get on to how you discovered the story and why you wanted to write the book, but you had to kind of untangle this Gordian knot of, of, of legend and myth and actually get back to what the story was and, and, uh, and start again, which I think is why your book couldn't have really been written 30 years ago, because 30 years ago, it would have been difficult to get out of the, of the myth. Um, yeah, but, but, but the surprising thing is, okay, I get that the Soviet Union had its own reasons for having this mythology about this rebellion. These were heroic allied soldiers, basically, and they deserve medals. I get that. And, and, and they portrayed themselves that way. And the surviving leader of the Georgian rebellion was a guy named Evgeny uh, Artemidze, who created a mythology. He wrote a little book about himself, and he created a little museum in his, in his home, which I visited. And his mm -hmm. gravestone, which I think is in the book, is, you know, shows that he was the, one of the heroic leaders together with the Ladze of this great rebellion. And they benefited from the mythology, and the Soviet Union benefited from it. And the Dutch communists certainly came off looking good. But you wonder why 45 years later, when Georgia becomes an independent country, post-communist, rediscovering its history, relearning that basically everything the Communist Party ever told us was a lie, all the history they was made up, and they had to rediscover this. This part of history was not rediscovered. And I think part of the reason was it, it also suited the um, ideas of, the, of certain Georgian nationalists most particularly um, Saakashvili, the president who was president of Georgia during the last war with the Russians. Right. He was very much a Georgian nationalist. And he, this story was a good story for him. He, he's married to a, a Dutch woman and they went to Georgia together to Tessa, which I recount the story in the book. Yep, yep. He, he talked about the, these heroes there and he kind of repeated Soviet mythology. This man was the furthest thing from a Soviet or communist figure. But he repeated Soviet mythology about the events in Tessa, which I found quite striking that, why haven't they created a new history? Why have they not learned the real history of what happened there? These men were hardly, you know, loyal Stalin loving communists. They really weren't. They really were German soldiers. They, they rebelled for their own reasons, but not out of any love of communism or, or the Soviet Union or even Georgia. They just wanted to get home. Maybe it's just a simple case of it's easier to tell the version that's simple than it is actually going unravel that is what is, you know, quite a complicated situation. I mean, you know, we, we, we haven't really done it justice in the, you know, three to five minutes we've had, but it, it you know, this, the Dutch involvement, the Georgian involvement, it, it is, it is quite difficult. I mean, I asked you in our Zoom, you know, test, and you mentioned earlier, you know, the, who are the goodies, who are the baddies, you know, and you said you're still not really sure, really. I mean, ultimately, I, I, you know, it is hard to kind of pin down exactly who although, the goodies are in Although it has, it has to be said, look, the 85 Dutch people who were killed there, maybe with one exception, were killed by yeah. the Germans. The war yeah, crimes largely were carried out by the Germans. And the, and the Germans had no right to be there, a point that some of the Dutch people made. They had no right to be on that island. That was It was, yeah. it was an illegal yeah. occupation of the Netherlands. So the, the moral responsibility for the, every life lost there falls first and foremost on, on the Germans. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. And the Georgians are just simply trying to survive. So yeah, the Georgians you know, did. You can't did, blame yeah. anybody for wanting to try and ensure their own survival. And, and the Dutch just get, yeah. unfortunately, as always in war, uh, it's the collateral damage of civilian populations getting getting in the way. But so yeah. tell us as we round things up. You've, there's a cemetery there, which is very unusual because it doesn't have graves; it has has flowers. So yes. tell us about what there remains on Tessel there to this to the rebellion to the uprising. Yeah, this, this is the cemetery. It's rows and rows of red roses. There's, I think, one plant for each uh, Georgian soldier buried there. Um, this cemetery was created immediately after the Germans left the island. The Georgians were given a plot of land. Apparently, it was a plot of land owned by a, not a collaborator. His land was seized from him. It's in a beautiful part of the center of the island, tranquil, surrounded by trees. There are, you know, cows and sheep grazing nearby. And 
it's a very quiet place to sit and ponder. You can see now on the right side of the that wall, you can see on a blue background, a hammer and sickle. Hammer and sickle, yeah. Yeah, but in front of it is a big white cross. What, the, what this, is, this is, this is the various uh, versions of iterations of the cemetery over many years. It was for many years called the Russian cemetery because the people living on the island didn't know what the difference was. Now it's the Georgian military cemetery of Tessel. Um, there are Georgian symbols. There are, there are words written in Cyrillic script in Russian. There's a, um, it's a real mishmash going on there. These days it's officially a Georgian military site was maintained by, by the Dutch. And the Georgians yeah. have, a, have a ceremony there every year to, to mark the, their rebellion. And Georgian officials come. Uh, and, the, and the Dutch are quite interesting. I mean, I'm a, some friends of mine, the Liberation Europe route, Joel Stoples and those other guys, they, they, they include stops in, on Tesla in their books and on their websites. But it seems to be largely unknown to English speaking. I mean, so... I mean, yes. hopefully, well, your book will hopefully change that a little bit. But we didn't discuss at the beginning. How, how did you get hold of the story? And what was your motivation for doing the book? Well, firstly, the, the, I was told when I was writing it, someone, someone told me, don't ever say this is an unknown story. It's a well-known story in the Netherlands. Yeah. And to a degree in, in Georgia, the, the story the Georgians know is largely untrue. But it is a known story. It's not known in the English-speaking world at all. Um, I stumbled on it. Um, First of all, it appears oddly enough in a book I did about the uh, Operation Basalt, which is a British commando raid on Sark in 1942, yeah. because there were Georgians in the Channel Islands. And at a certain point, some were taken to Sark because there had been a rebellion on Tessel. The, Ger Ger the Germans didn't want Georgians uh, to collect, you know, put them together in a single place. They dispersed them a bit. That's how some Georgians wound up on Sark. So I knew about it from there. But more importantly, I had been working on the history of Georgia for decades, my interest was in the three years of Georgian independence from 1918 to 1921. It was, they created a very interesting society. It was a, um, I thought it was a kind of model of what a democratic socialist mm. society would look like. And you have to learn Georgian history more broadly in the history that after 1921 to understand what happened. So that's how I, I took an interest because my interest in Georgia and the Georgian people and their extraordinary history and, and the tragedy of, of, of Georgia as a country in the 20th century. So it is a tragic story. Yeah. And what I should point out to people watching this, and there's been some great comments coming on YouTube and how there are people going to go and look into this, investigate it, is that we haven't got into that what you do do in the book, which you do, you do do a background of Georgia and how Georgia comes yes. into existence and it's becoming independent. And you set much more of a, of, um, um, a, a scene around this. We've just focused on this isolated story, but you put a lot more padding around it to fill it all out and talk about in greater detail. So, you know, and, and what's the reaction been like from from descendants of Georgians? Have you had any people come to you or, and say, yeah, well, you know? Well, I mean, first of all, the, the, the book came out at the same time as it came out in English. It came out in a Dutch edition by a Dutch publisher and a Georgian edition immediately because the Georgians had also published my previous book about Georgia. Right, yeah. I have a very good publisher there and she does great work and, and a Czech edition. So there was immediate interest in a number of countries in, in the book. The Georgians themselves... I think I, I've been told what they really like about the story is that it's a balanced story. It's an honest account thing. It's not a myth. It's a bit of myth busting, but I don't have my own myth or, or take on the story. Who's good, who's bad, who are the heroes, who are the villains. I just tell the story as, as it happened. And it's an important story for the Georgians. It's part of their national history. It, it reveals a lot about them and something they have to remember. And so I, and I had a lot of positive help in Georgia, including uh, being taken by one of George's, probably George's most famous living writer, uh, Dato Turashvili, took me to the home of Artemidze out in the mountains with Artemidze's daughter, who I was able to interview in the car. I talk about her father, the role he played, the rebellion was fascinating. So I think the Georgians themselves do want to know their, their real history. And that's why the publication of the book in Georgian was so important to me. Yeah, and I mean, I mean, and what I liked about it was, is it it it, it go, went into the complicated nature of foreign troops serving with the German army and how that whole get that whole thing is very complicated. The the, the complications of, of resistance. I did a show about Denmark at war, where this whole subject of communists in Denmark came up and how they kind of quashed their own history, and then it kind of got thrown out. And 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 we have the same thing in France with the communist resistance, and the the, the, the version is generally told from the De Gaulle side of things, and the communists get kind of pushed out of the way. So that was interesting. Thing. and and this this symbolism as i mentioned earlier of, of hitler's idiocy in that he you know in the middle of you know while the while the, 
while the city is burning. He's sending people out to do this revenge mission. It's it's symbolic of his madness. So yes. it's it's an amazing book. And I'm, I'm, there's definitely going to be people who are buying it. And I want to bring you back on again to do something about Sark because that fits in with things we're doing about Operation Aquatint and Major Mark Phillips and those kind of people. So we'll bring you on to do that again. So what are you working on now? What's the next project? Um, my, my publisher wants me to do a very long introduction to, uh, we want to publish the entire dossier of Operation Foxley. You know Operation Foxley? I don't think no? I do, no. Operation Foxley was the secret uh, British plan to kill Hitler in 1944. Oh, right, okay. Yes. So it's a plan, and it was never obviously attempted. But yeah, yeah, plan. yeah. Was that the one they were thinking of getting the Jewish brigade involved? Is that, no. Is that, no, 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 no. No, no this okay. was the, the, there were several crazy parts of the plan, like uh, hypnotizing Rudolf Hess and sending him back to Germany to kill Hitler to hypnosis. But the, the main uh, plan was to have a sniper um, take out Hitler on his 20 minute morning walk in um, Berchtesgaden, in his uh -huh. outline retreat. He would go on a walk alone to the tea house every morning at 10 o'clock. A sniper in the woods could have taken him out. That was the plan. So we're oh, gonna well, publish well, the- I look forward the, to that, so. Yeah, the whole dossier and I'm writing a long introduction to it. Well, um, in terms that, we'll look forward to that. Well, I think we've, you know, we've done an hour here. In terms of just for people watching, uh, I want to thank a few more patrons for for signing up in the last few days. So, Jim O'Neill, Philip Bell, Leighton Hughes, Jonathan Mil Millwood, Jeff Feller, and Eric Adler. Thank you for your uh, contributions. And uh, we've got our Living History panel tomorrow night, same time, 8 p.m. Euro Europe, 7 p.m. UK, where we're talking to uh, living historians, reenactors about why they um, portray World War II soldiers. We'll do that. And then we've got various, we might be squeezing in a show on Gold Beach with Peter Caddick Adams this weekend. If the weather holds up, we'll see how that goes. But Eric, um, they can obviously buy your book in all the all the usual places where, where books are. And there's a link to your website in the description below. So um, it's been a fascinating interview. And um, I there's uh, the Canadian interest has been quite, quite, quite uh, good on YouTube. So um, I wish you success with your book and, um, and and your future book. And you're welcome to come back on World War II TV anytime. So uh, okay, enjoy it very much, Paul. Thank, Thank you. you very much, Eric. And for, for those watching, uh, this has been Paul Woodhead for World War II TV saying um, we'll see you all next time. So thank you very much. Goodbye.